Um, today we have um, a very interesting webinar on a topic that you're all ex expressed interest in um, by, by registering the adaptation of coastal cities for climate resilience. This webinar is being brought to you by the Queensland Division of ATSI and um, our two speakers are based in Queensland, one in Brisbane and one on the Gold Coast. So I think um, it will be fascinating. The um, format will be um, one speaker after another, then we'll have um, quite a bit of time available for questions. Um, and uh, you'll be able to add those in online. So first of all, can I please, um, acknowledge country as we gather for this meeting from different places around Australia. I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we meet. Um, I'm joining you from Turbal land in Brisbane. I pay respect to elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who join us online today. As we share and discuss our own knowledge and practices, we acknowledge the deep knowledge forever embedded in custodianship of country. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, please be aware this meeting is being recorded and will be published on the Academy's YouTube channel. Um, should you have any questions during the webinar, please utilize the Q&A function found in the Zoom ribbon. And we also encourage you to upvote any questions by liking them. So um, my name is Leanne Bond and I'm pleased to be the moderator for this webinar. I'm a fellow of ATSI and a member of the Queensland Division Committee. Um, the, I'll just read out the synopsis of today's event. Coastal cities are at the front line of the climate change battle already we have seen sea level rises submerging low-lying city areas permanently or more frequent heavy rainfall causing flash flooding and intense cyclones resulting in costly and devastating destruction to coastal livelihoods, infrastructure and property. So how can urban areas reduce or adapt to changing climate risks? In this webinar, we have Professor Yul Bowmaster to talk on Cities Plus One M urban development solutions for sea level rise and Mr. Pradesh Ramya to speak on adapting to climate change, the Gold Coast experience. So firstly, we have Professor Yor Bymaster, who is leading the Sea Cities Lab at the Cities Research Institute at Griffith University in Australia, which develops and implements water adapted urban solutions or aqua cities and floating structures, aquatecture. Its holistic research approach that spans and includes the disciplines of engineering, architecture and environmental sciences enables research in the group to develop new approaches to building with and for nature to create ecosystem-based developments that respond to the current challenges in an adaptive and compatible fashion. Jörg has been a practitioner, educator and researcher for architecture and urban design for more than 20 years throughout Europe, Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, Asia and Australia. He is an award-winning architect and consults environment, uh, governmental institutions on the federal, state and regional level as well as NGOs. So um, I'd like to welcome York to make his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lian. Um, thanks for joining everybody. Uh, and also thanks Luke and all the others for the invitation. Um, I'm just starting here. One moment. So that's fine, yeah? Everybody can see something. Um, so I'm uh, leading the Cities 
So the, the CCT Lab, which is a part of the Cities Research Institute, it is based on Gold Coast campus at Griffith University and it's land of the Yugambe and the Kombumeri people. Um, our passion is um, to find exciting opportunities that relieve land-based population pressures and um, also to develop sustainable developments. Um, and um, in the end, it's about combating climate change with aquatic innovations. Um, please check if you are interested our two web pages. The one is my personal one, which is just jörgbaumeister.com and uh, cctis.org. Um, we have three main themes. The first one is about floating developments. The second one is about aquaculture. And the third theme is about aquatic urbanism. Unfortunately, I don't have time to... Oh, okay. Okay, there it's written. Uh, to go through all the different themes a little bit more in detail, therefore just some nice, I uh, hopefully you like them, um, photos, images, simulations. Um, the third one, first one is about Sea Manta, which is a floating reef, and it has in its belly um, um, a fish a nursery and different dive attractions, um, and you can, you can grow there um, really an artificial reef, so this is developed with marine scientists together and engineers. Um, and um, on the top, there's also a kind of an event center and um, a center for dive tourism. On the right hand side, we can see um, the so-called sea base, which is a uh, quite new structure. So we were inventing them. Uh, so not to put too much energy and pollution um, into, um, into the creation of all these big um, concrete platforms, uh, but um, to come up with another structure and um, the structure um, can be used for different purposes. It's, it's modular um, and um, therefore the, the dimension is also very flexible. Here's, here are just some examples um, about, um, for example, um, one possibility um, function as a survey center, as a floating survey center, or uh, something to launch micro uh, launches, or you can also use it, for example, for floating um, hydrogen plants, which would be very close to floating wind turbines to create um, in situ hydrogen. Um, then we are also very much interested in aquaculture and new applications for that. So on the left hand side, this are sea oasis, so, um, which, which um, transfers the knowledge of desert oasis, um, which are um, enclosed systems onto the sea. And we are coming up with a kind of a, a system of aqua pots, so the floating elements. Which, um, which have different functions and the combination of them is also creating a kind of a self-sustainable enclosed system, which is producing fish, algae and other things. And on the, on the right hand side, uh, that's a new project which just started. That's a part of the CRC Blue Economy. Uh, it's a major project for 2 million. And uh, this is a, about a, a quite large floating structure called either Sea Deeper or Sea Fisher, depending on the construction. Um, and that's something we are currently also um, creating. With, uh, the purpose is um, to put the first prototype in Tasmania um, to, um, to breed um, salmon there. Um, and then we are also interested in the urban scale. So this is about aqua cities on the left hand side. That's the question how we use um, water coming from flooding, prey water, fresh water and wastewater in a, in a much more um, um, not only sustainable but also smart way which is creating networks then and use, uses it um, in a way so that um, there's almost no additional water needed, depending, of course, on the different climatic situations. And today we are speaking about uh, the cities plus one meter on the right hand side. And this is about urban scenarios of, the, of potential um, urban developments. So, um, before we are starting with cities plus one meter um, and um, 
the name is hopefully quite obvious. It's about the question what is happening uh, with cities if sea level rise is, is going up one meter. Um, I wanted to show you this, for me, super interesting uh, photo, which is in the end demonstrating a huge failure coming mainly from um, uh, people who thought they could protect against sea level rise. So um, that's um, just close to the Israeli coast. And during the underwater excavation of a 7,000 year old settlement, a wall made of large stones with a length of more than 100 meter was discovered, which stretched parallel to the coastline. The wall is now 90 meter offshore and about three meters below the sea level. So this is an unsuccessful coastal defense against sea level rise. So um, I think we should learn out of this history that perhaps protection of coasts are not all the time um, the best solutions, especially if it's just about a kind of a long wall protecting against the rising sea. Because the sea will rise. So um, this is now very new here. It's, uh, this is a publication coming from Nature Re Reviews from Earth and Environment 2022. And, um, and um, they were coming up with following two scenarios. So the one question was, what would happen if we would start now, today, this year, um, with a decrease of CO2 and other um, greenhouse gases? by 8% per year, which is massive, yeah? So this is, this is already um, quite, quite theoretical. Um, and um, I think the change of the industry um, in this, in this um, 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 speed is not possible, but that would, that would allow us to stay with the plus um, of 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. So a little bit more realistic would be a decrease per year by 4% greenhouse gases from now on. Um, and then we would be um, at around two degrees Celsius warming. And you see here how the curves would develop. And now relating that to sea level um, rise, um, you can see that this uh, and now um, the, the x-axis, so, so the horizontal axis is indicating the years. So in 2100, we would have a sea level rise of around um, 0.6 meters if we would go with this, out of my opinion, really unrealistic a scenario of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the other one uh, with a two degree, uh, two degrees Celsius would, um, would then let the sea level rise by 90 centimeters until 2100. This doesn't include high impact scenarios, which could be, for example, also consider ice sheet instability processes. And that's something um, researchers are currently working a lot at that because nobody knows how ice sheet um, is melting. And uh, because we are using currently just satellites, we can't see below the ice um, or tipping points of Gulf Stream. So um, the curve would, could go up much more dramatically. So in the end, nobody knows when we will have a, a one meter sea level rise. Um, so instead of coming up with scenarios which are indicating a specific year, we said um, we, are, we are saying, um, or we are asking the question, how can we adapt cities to plus one meter sea level rise? Either this will happen already in 30 years or perhaps in 70 or in 80 years. Um, so, and um, just before we are starting, uh, I want to show you um, the four current uh, scenarios, strategies against or with sea level rise. The one is to protect the seawalls and other uh, infrastructure um, uh, systems. The next one is to, uh, to accommodate. The third one is retreat. And the fourth one is advance. So this is somehow common, common knowledge. Some people have different um, terms for that. But and, and IPCC is adding a fifth one, which is, um, which is also here included in one of the others in the, uh, in the retreat one. So this is common knowledge. And what we have 
um, been doing before. Um, and this is published in a Springer Nature book, which is called Sea Cities Urban Tactics for Sea Level Rise. Um, we were now combining the four different strategies which are known with the five different urban elements. So about, uh, we, were, we were combining building space, production places, community places, infrastructure, natural, natural in, environment. So this are, that's also common sense, um, the five different elements, um, which, which is about built environment. And we were combining that and so, so that we came up with uh, 20 different tactics, how to use now or how to, how, to, how to deal with sea level rise in different ways. And this is the base of this book. This is currently um, um, with Springer. We have currently some layout discussions. Everything else is ready to print. It will be released hopefully uh, in June 2022. And um, it's about urban development solutions for sea level rise. And then we are starting first um, with uh, here with guidelines. And then afterwards, we are coming up with a case study, which is demonstrating how to apply this guideline. So instead of, instead of um, being a designer coming up with the solution for this specific area, we are coming up with a manual, which can be used everywhere um, in terms of creating different um, scenarios, different possible design solution to develop cities in a way so that, that they can adapt to one meter sea level rise. Um, the, 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 this guideline um, has four different steps and um, we will go um, in this case study now through the steps. Um, and uh, before I just want to explain, so first of all, it's about analyzing. So the more knowledge we have, the, the more we are able to come up with really realistic and um, um, solutions and with solutions which are adapted to a very, very specific area with a specific identity, because that's of course something we want to keep. And then um, the next step will be about the con different concepts and about different tactics. And um, um, this is the most challenging thing. And um, um, hopefully I can explain it to you in a way so that everybody will understand that. And then uh, the third step in this manual is then a feedback round so that the community can comment on that. Um, and then the end will be the final scenarios. And of course, we can have some more feedback loops. So if the final scenarios, they can also go back into a feedback round and then be improved again. Or we can also start from the very beginning if it was really not successful. So now I just show you some pages of this test run. Uh, we were picking one area which has currently lots of challenges already due to sea level rise and due to flooding. And um, this is um, um, an area which is, which is in the Gold Coast, um, Coast Gold uh, Council area and it's close to a river. And you see here already um, the um, location. Um, in the square, so that's indicated in the square here. And um, so that's here. And then um, the first thing which is very important to understand, why is there a sea level rise issue already now? Um, and so therefore we are looking for old maps, for old photo photographs, and uh, we were finding out that there was already an old water passage and then in 1930s, and then the first houses were developed. Um, and then there, was, there were coming more and more houses then onto the site. And in the end, there's a small little new water passage, which is flooded very often. Um, then also as part of the analysis, um, we, were, we, were, we were looking at the site um, in situ and we were, we were just checking or taking all, um, only not only photos, but also we were coming up with specific locations and uh, locations which could be very interesting in the future. 
So um, there was a mangrove forest, for example, there was already a kind of a floating platform, which was very interesting, a house on wheels. And then there were two story houses, which were already starting to adapt to sea level rise, a basketball field, which was sometimes flooded and so on. Um, and then we were simulating um, what would happen if we would have already now a sea level rise of plus one meter. And, um, and this was very interesting and very, very important for us so, um, to, to come up to, to produce, to generate a risk map um, with the indication of the different risks. And you see already, so very close to the river, um, there's not only houses, buildings at risk, um, a path at risk, other infrastructure at risk, but also trees, lots of trees there. They are also highly at risk. And then, um, and that's important for, for, for the second step, uh, we were also subdividing the site. So the, the idea of the subdivision of the site was that um, to come up with very, very um, locally adapted solutions, so instead of coming up with the one solution for the whole site, we said we want to come up with combinations of different solutions. And we want to make this, the sites um, 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 smaller, the individual sites, so that we can be much more precise with our future proposals. Um, and then we were, we were also um, coming up with this kind of list of risks on opportunities. And you see, um, again, we are, we are taking the different urban elements. So we are looking at the existing buildings and spaces. Um, we are coming up with the plus and with the minus of that in terms of flooding issues as a minus, for example, but also um, pluses as, pro, for example, potential urban developments um, and in the Eastern part in this case, um, and then um, also some other areas were underutilized uh, wonderful sea views uh, from a certain height and intense water connection to the river. So it was the same with the production and community infrastructure and the natural environment. It was not just about um, um, the um, having, having just risks. So it's not just about risk management, it's also about opportunities. And then we were summarizing that and um, um, I was just um, putting that a little bit in a, some, in a extended version here. So this is a kind of a summary. So and what we were um, finding out was that um, there are lots of opportunities on the site. So there's an opportunity, one, if required protective seawalls or dikes can be upgraded with infrastructure, energy, food production. And it, um, um, opportunity number two is that great potential for urban upgrading with great sea views, as I said already before. Opportunity number three, um, that uh, we, we have, for example, in the Western part, um, a kind of a natural community place with mangroves and wetland opportunities. And then opportunity number four, there are great possibilities for new production facilities, including aquaculture and water development. This allowed us now to get forward onto the step two. And perhaps you remember, we have all the different tactics, which are a combination of the different four strategies and the five different urban elements. And um, they allow us now to combine, I think I'll, the best is to go to the next one, to, to combine each of the strategy, each of the tactic, we can project that on each of the individual um, sub sites. Yeah, so remember, we were, we were, we were um, just um, cutting the whole site into small pieces, and now we are projecting onto each of the pieces um, um, the different options. That sounds very complicated, and it was a little bit. So we had, we had lots of results, and to, to be able to deal with the results, we were coming up with four different concepts. 
The first concept was a concept we were calling minimal change. So, um, so we want to keep as much as possible. The second concept was about the maximal yield. So that's interesting for perhaps developers. Um, the third concept was about the maximal nature. So this was more about for, for nature lovers. And the fourth concept was maximum water um, with extra um, aquatic functions. And um, with this concepts, we were now selecting the best sub areas um, and the best tactics for the sub areas. So this is a combination now. So we are not just using the four different strategies and coming up just with four different uh, proposals. We were, we were going one, um, one um, scale down and um, this allows us now to have to have really diff, uh, to to have a kind of a possibility to um, to 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 present four different opportunities, which are for, for um, following the four different concepts. So um, the first one, as I said, that's minimal change. So to succeed in minimal change, protection elements are used in locations that are identified as high risk based on the risk map information. That's something I've shown you before. And parts of the site that is currently composed of mangrove forest will, will, will retreat so that the mangrove forest can expand. So this is really, um, what do we have to do to reduce the, cast, the, the cost? That's minimal change. The next strategy was about the maximum yield. So the exact, um, existing conditions will have to accommodate to the one meter water level, including the areas. And now I, we can't go through the different uh, sub areas, but you see on the small diagram below that they are indicated here. So area number two is for example, the area which is close to the river and so on. And um, we are proposing for that, that they, are, they can be equipped with buildings constructed on podiums. And then there are other areas which are able to collect water. Um, and of course, um, area number three, which with the existing mangroves will keep the mangroves close. Um, the third opportunity is about maximal nature. And um, um, so this is about um, um, maximize the natural environment. And um, all areas are proposed to retreat and eventually become a wetland. However, and now the areas six, seven, and nine, so that are the Western areas, which are a little bit um, elevated. They are designed to accommodate residential towers raised on stilts so that the natural environment can expand on the ground level. This is just to counter um, finance the rest of the, of, of the areas which will be naturalized. And then the fourth opportunity is about just not thinking all the time as, um, um, as everything being land, but um, just inverse our thinking to maximize the water. To succeed the maximal water, this proposal allows the water to extend towards the inland. The existing areas are redesigned so one, two, three, four, that, that are the Western parts. So on the left-hand side are redesigned to the floating development, which supports the natural flow of water. And then um, there are also new developments on the right-hand side. You see here the high rises. They are also um, to, to counter finance the whole, the whole um, um, proposal, the whole development. You see also all the time on the bottom of all four opportunities, um, what different concepts, concepts we are using, which tactics, and what kind of opportunities have been created. So this is now just coming out of our brain, and therefore we needed now feedback from the community, and we did some community sessions, and Pradesh was so kind also to be, to participate in one of the sessions, and we were asking 
all the members of the different sessions about the advantages and the disadvantages of each individual scenario. And um, this was for us highly important because in the end, we are designing this, this scenarios for, for, for the community. Yeah, so um, we, 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 are, we shouldn't be arrogant as planners and come up with our own ideas and then just try to develop these ideas in our own um, thinking. It's more about delivering different possibilities and then coming up through the um, community sessions um, with, um, with an optimization process so, and so that in the end, all stakeholders get that the maximum out of that. So um, I don't go through all the different advantages and disadvantages, but um, the result of that was that we got final scenarios. So we were um, improving our four different options again um, as outcome of the community consultations. And um, we are just showing you one simulation. So we are, we are, we are looking now um, first um, onto the original view of the site. And then we are, or I'm presenting then the four different scenarios, minimal change, maximal yield, maximal nature and maximal water as drawings, yeah, as, as perspectives, as simulations, which are based on photos, of course. So this is the existing exist, uh, existing condition. You see here this canal, the small little canal, and then there, there are already here areas flooded. Here there's an old industrial building on the right. And then on the left hand side, you see some of the buildings which are endangered. And that would be now the, the minimal change to, to, to build a wall. And it could be even a kind of a wall which could be used as an urban element. Um, and um, and um, to build a wall against the sea level rise so that the sea level um, wouldn't um, influence too much the, the, the buildings on the right hand side because there's also this wall as a protection wall and then behind the stepped um, um, wall dike um, you see also the, the buildings which are now protected. Um, this is one possible um, opportunity. And um, the next one is about maximal yield. So we are extending that to come up with a kind of a, um, with a, with a more um, attractive situation. And then we are developing that in a way that of course we get a certain density, but at the same time, and we, we need the density because we have to create the podiums, which are helping us um, to, to, to get above this one meter sea level rise. Um, and then at the, at, the, at the other hand, and um, this is a really conceptual drawing. Yeah, please don't think that, the, that we think that it, the architecture should look like that. It's more about showing, hey, there's, an um, there's a very attractive interior, which is connected to the river. And then um, we are taking advantage in terms of the real estate development and, um, and, and we are cross-financing that the, 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 this new structures um, which are needed against the sea level rise. Um, the maximal nature is doing exactly the opposite um, because we are leaving the one part as it is and it will become more and more wetland. And uh, then on the right hand side, um, we, uh, we have these elevated um, buildings and they, they can become also very, very creamy. Um, but in the end, um, the yield is not as, as, as attractive as um, the scenario before. Um, and that, that's the last one here. So that's the maximum water where, where we can have even floating buildings, floating aquaculture, floating parks, um, everything could float or um, it could be beneath the floating elements to take also advantage out of this proximity to the water. So um, it's very important that we don't come, we don't wanna come up with the one solution yet. And it's also very important that we are not coming with the one engineering solution. So perhaps some, some engineers would say, hey, 
you can just build nice walls and that's it yeah so that's that's what is happening currently already in some 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 countries for example i know it from indonesia jakarta they are building a huge seawall then there and they try to avoid sea level rise which is quite stupid i think because uh, most of the um, challenge in, in jakarta are are, are not due to sea level rise, they are more due to sinking land. Anyway, so, so we have four different possibilities and we can now, and that would be the next steps now, we can find mixtures or we can follow one scenario. So, so um, that would be the next steps now. And um, um, we have um, already one community, which is very important to continue now with that. And um, so, and, and therefore um, we were already suggesting to them that in the end we have to find the final scenario. Um, and either it is about a mixture of the four different scenarios or we are highlighting one. And then um, the next step would be then um, also um, fo followed by feasibility studies, uh, final decisions for, for a combined scenario and then the whole formal planning design implementation process starts. So this sounds perhaps a little bit complicated, but it is about urban planning and urban development, and that should be complicated to make not too, too much um, um, uh, mistakes. Um, so the last thing I wanna say is that um, this, publication is not coming just out of my brain. Um, the co-author is the, the Spina Linaraki, who is also working at Griffith and who's one of my PhD researchers at the same time. That's it. Thank you very much, Jörg. That was, um, that was very interesting and I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. Can I just um, ask everyone to put their questions into the Q&A and we'll do them together at the end. Um, but now we'll go to our second presentation. Um, so this is uh, Pradesh Ramaya. Pradesh is an urban planner with the City of Gold Coast Natural Hazards team. His past experience includes working across state and local governments and the private sector. Pradesh's work has been recognised with commendations and awards from the New South Wales and Queensland governments for his contribution to coastal policy. His current role is to develop and advance the city's land use and development policy in areas subject to current and future natural hazards, such as coastal hazards, flooding, landslide and bushfire. He steadfastly promotes nature-based outcomes that promote urban resilience and the mitigation of future climate risks. Pradesh often participates as a guest lecturer at Bond and Griffith Universities. Um, welcome, Pradesh. Um, <clears throat> hello, Leanne uh, and others, and uh, thanks, Jorg, for um, your presentation too. Um, just checking to make sure that everybody can hear me and see my screen. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go from there. So. Um, uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I'll just like to start off by, uh, I can go forward. Next, I lost my buttons. Uh, just to uh, again um, uh, acknowledge uh, and welcome to country. I uh, uh, respectfully acknowledge the, the people of the Yugambeh language region um, here on the Gold Coast, the traditional owners on the land in which we meet and pay respects to elders past and present, and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today. Um, uh, this, this photograph is uh, of Burley Headland, for those who might be familiar uh, of the southern Gold Coast. And um, it's, it's not only uh, quite a, a significant bit of uh, uh, value to traditional owners, it also shows you know, that uh, we've got the training wall on the right-hand side, which was a product of some of the coastal protection work that was done um, uh, a, few, a couple of decades ago to, to manage some of the coastal risks. But, um, uh, I'll keep going. Today's presentation, um, I guess uh, I, I understand that it's, it's quite a wide variety of people attending this and, and not many people might uh, appreciate the, the Gold Coast. I mean, you probably are very familiar to it, uh, but I'm, I'm, uh, but there, there is a, a, there is a lot to, to, to acknowledge um, and it's unique to our city. 
Um, I'm also a, a planner. Um, I, I do have a, a science degree and I work closely with engineers, but for my sins, I am a, uh, a land use planner. So much of what we'll be talking about a bit later in this presentation um, and needs to be viewed in context um, of, uh, of both the evolution of our, our planning regulatory and, and some of the drivers to uh, land use policy. Um, so, uh, uh, so again, yeah, for those, for those who are in other cities or in other jurisdictions, um, you know, some of this may not all be relevant to you, but at least you hopefully will get some insight into how we have uh, uh, addressed the issues. And uh, today we're uh, looking spe specifically at, at flooding and sea level rise, although my, um, my, my responsibilities do include um, bushfire uh, and landslide and, and heat now is starting to become uh, uh, an emerging uh, risk. But um, without, we'll keep going through. So um, I apologize, I tried, I was wanted to get a lovely sort of word cloud graphic to sort of explain everything about um, the Gold Coast in, in one slide, um, but it's, it's just impossible. And so I, I just quickly put through a table, but um, it, it is a big city, a uh, big, big area rather. And it is, and it is, well, Australia's largest regional city, um, the city of the Gold Coast. It, you know, it has a, it's a population that's growing uh, quite rapidly. We, we offer a lot of jobs and businesses. Um, uh, there are there are lots of character and identity. Um, significantly, we have a lot of water. Um, there's over 200 kilometres of waterways in our city, natural and artificial. Uh, uh, we have six major catchments and uh, 50 kilometres of our, uh, open coast. Um, now, our budget is quite large. Unfortunately, not all of it, not a lot of it comes my way in the environment section, but um, uh, but it is a very large budget. Um, I think at last count, there was about $20 billion worth of assets that the city manages. 85% um, of the area is affected by bushfire, flood, landslide and coastal hazards, including erosion and, and storm tide. So you know, it's, it's, it's pretty hard not to throw a stick in, in our city and, and not be affected by at least one um, natural hazard constraint, um, if not more than one. Um, there's very few bits of unconstrained land in the city. Uh, we have we have a lot of um, we have a large uh, shallow estuary called the Broadwater, uh, which is quite bi biologically diverse and, and provides a lot of uh, recreational opportunities for the city. Um, we have a large agricultural uh, area to the north uh, with cane lands, and um, our largest river catchment, the Narang River, supports uh, uh, 1,800 uh, hectare. Uh, flood storage basin, which I'll, I'll talk to as well. So um, interestingly enough, our climate is is quite interesting. Not only are we subject to the southerly migrations of, of cyclones in summer and, and low pressure systems, we also get the east coast, east coast lows in, in winter. So we're one of the few places on the east coast of Australia that uh, is is under threat um, from the weather and the climate um, uh, 20, uh, 12 months of the year. Uh, this particular year, La Nina, um, since since about February, we've we've been um, we've we've been subjected to a number of rainfall events, um, and of course, yeah, we were, we were fortunate that our city managed to get away a little bit unscathed. Unfortunately, it couldn't be the same for just across the border. But there is a lot of infrastructure that's been built in the city. Um, uh, there's a lot of great natural area. We've got great native veg cover, uh, and um, more importantly. Um, since about 2005, uh, planning, at least for flood planning levels in the city have accounted for sea level rise. Uh, and in 2018, we updated our, our flood planning levels um, and uh, we incorporated the 80 centimetres by 2100 parameter, which is, is state government policy at the moment. And uh, we're currently in the process of reviewing and updating our city plan, our planning scheme. Um, to, to uh, improve our, our regulation and development control of flood affected areas. But we've also just remodeled um, uh, the hydrology of the city um, uh, with two flow and uh, using the 2019 AR&R rainfall uh, outputs. So um, yeah, there's been quite a bit going on in, in our city at the moment. Um, <clears throat> 
one thing one thing we've benefit of and i apologize for the the scale of these maps but um you know one of the biggest things that probably people forget about the gold coast is our beaches and our coastline and waterways aren't our our, our greatest asset um yeah, we we have an enormous amount of open green space in the city um and and it's well planned for and it's well identified and its values are, are well documented and and it's conservation protection and and, and uh, um, uh, uh, preservation um, you know uh, does fall back on a lot of great planning uh, and engineering decisions uh, and science science informed decisions uh, to conserve it so um, again the scale of the city is quite big so I, I apologize for the detail here but as you can see, um, this is the extent of our, our biodiversity or vegetation protection overlay. Uh, a lot of our open space is is uh, is is um, is not natural. Uh, sorry, national parks. Um, it comprises reserves, and a lot of it is private land owners. Uh, council owns and manages about ten percent of, of the city area. Uh, and just to be clear. For clarification, the northern bit there is the, the Canelands area. Uh, this bit here is probably our, our emerging urban area of the, the Coomera Helens Vale area. Um, uh, through here, uh, it, uh, it, oh, sorry, is part of the Helens Vale. Um, this is what we call the Parkwood, where uh, the Gold Coast University Hospital and, and Gold Griffith University are centered. And our main, our main urban area is within this particular part of the city, which is essentially the, the Narang River catchment, the, the lower part of the Narang River catchment. And of course, uh, the Southern Gold Coast starts to extend through here. Um, the examples that Jorg were talking about in his presentation occur within here. And then of course, we've got Coolangatta and, and everything stops north, uh, stops at the border, of course. Um, but but yeah, as you can see, we have we have enormous, we the conservation of open space and, con and its protection are, are, uh, uh, well documented in the city and there is a lot of values there and and um, as you can see through our water courses too the wetlands at the lower lying area um, have significant uh, values um, both locally regionally state and, and internationally and you can just start seeing here the extent to which the artificial waterways are starting to to occur within the city here so um, you know this is this is this is um uh, open space is one of the great assets of the city, and um, and if you look at it from a from a spatial spatial uh, land use zoning, um, over seventy percent of our city's area comprises rural open space, conservation or rural residential. Um, only ten percent of the land mass is zoned for residential development, um, and uh, and our new communities and employment industrial centres only account for about five five percent. So. Uh, you know, obviously flooding occurs and inundation is a threat to the lower parts of the catchment, um, bushfire and landslide obviously through here. Um, these are all, I guess, the, the hinterland parts. This is where, you know, the sloping land uh, forms part of the Great Dividing Range. Um, the M1, the main arterial, cuts through around, down through here. So um, the city, yeah, the city's got some nice uh, elements to it. And uh, and which which aids in our in our planning for the future. So uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have many great pictures to to share. But as a planner, it's uh, I'll, these next few slides will talk about some of the context in which we are operating. And I I do you know, my engineering colleagues um, and, uh, and, uh, and and scientific colleagues are sometimes a little bit aghast at, at, um, at the complexity in which we have to operate and make decisions. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's, it can be quite, quite a challenge as, as a planner. So our, our, uh, for those of you who know, may not be aware, land use planning is a, is a state uh, government initiative. Um, every state has its own planning act, uh, its own development assessment authority, and has its own um, environmental planning legal framework. And in Queensland, um, the environmental framework sits within here. It's quite complex. It applies across a, a variety of activities uh, and issues. Um, it, of course, sits neatly influenced by our external inputs being the international law of the Commonwealth and, of course, the common law. But at a, at a, at a simpler way to describe it, you know, the main acts that I often have to deal with 
and obligations fall under the, the Planning Act, the Coastal Protection and Management Act, and, and more generally under the Local Government Act. Um, and each of those are supported by subordinate regulation. Um, there's, there's policy, state planning policy, that sits uh, as a means to further articulate um, legislative outcomes. There's regional policy. And then of course we have our local government level sitting sort of in between and, and at, at, at the bottom of all of that. And uh, as a fairly, I mean, every local government, no matter what the sides needs to have its corporate plan and corporate strategies in, in place. Uh, and so we're no different. Um, we have quite a significant large corporate plan, um, a number of strategies that have all been adopted by the city. Uh, and these include our, our planning scheme uh, and which sits within our local government infrastructure plan. Um, our ocean beaches strategy, which is which is concerned with the ongoing protection of the uh, uh, of the beaches, uh, our na uh, our natural city, which is conservation uh, uh, and concerns the area uh, of, of the green bits that I showed before. Our water strategy and, and transport and waste strategies as well. So there's there's quite a bit there. Um, to keep it simple, and and I, and I and I'm sorry if this seems a little bit simplistic, but I, I pull this slide from one of the lectures I give to the, to the undergrads, and just to just to reduce the complexity of it, what what drives policy for land use planning and, and development assessment, and, and and of course that that framework, uh, are very very simple principles and rules, um, you know, at the state and, and local government level uh, level, and you know one of the things I often ask. Uh, people to be aware of uh, are the buzzwords and and um, and that a lot of it a lot of that language gets thrown about willy-nilly but you know there are there are very important elements that um, government needs to to embrace policy needs to uh, enact and, and fall through so at a local government level these these are all the things that influence our our, our approaches uh, uh, and and practices and our actions and and how we shape and, and plan for for the future. So obviously at local government level, fiscal responsibility and obligation is 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 a, is a massive is a massive element. Infrastructure management, service delivery and integration of um, you know coordinating that a, a, across a large a large area uh, like our city um, is is quite complex. Um, you know I, I you I, I did. I did used to work in in Waverley local government area in the East, Sydney's eastern suburbs, uh, and you know that that is in possession of some of the most expensive real estate in the country. But uh, it's only nine square kilometres inside, and only there's only eighty thousand odd residents. Um, you know, we're t coming to here, it's it's quite a significant upscaling of the issues that you know local government has to deal with. Um, so um, for some of you may not be aware that uh, the state, yeah, so drivers of land use policy come, come from the state. And um, for the last few years, the Queensland government, after quite a bit of period of reform uh, in, in land use and planning, um, uh, finally settled on, uh, uh, on, a, on a clear statement about uh, its planning policy, particularly with regards to natural hazards, risk and resilience. And, um, <clears throat> it made some very pertinent statements about um, what those are. So, you know, there's an emphasis there to, to, to look at the risks associated with natural hazards, including uh, the projected impacts of climate change, and at least they're avoided or mitigated so we can protect people and property and, and enhance uh, communities' resilience. So uh, the specific natural hazards we look at include flood, bushfire, landslide, uh, storm surge, and erosion, which form part of the coastal hazards element. Um, and of course, you know, when we started talking about resilience, what, what does it mean? Um, and, you know, quite simply, it's our, you know, our ability to adapt, adapt to changing conditions and prepare and withstand uh, rapid recovery from disruption. And as we can see, you know, the type of environments that we'll, type of weather events we'll be experiencing in the future will become more and more extreme, you know, as we can see down on the, uh, this, is, this, this is a photo of um, the Northern beaches in Sydney um, uh, after their significant storm event, which resulted uh, in rainfall. I, I think now most of that uh, in, in the coastal storms, which, which threatened um, Collaroy and Narrabeen uh, properties. Um, I think there's now a seven meter seawall in front of those properties. And um, this picture here is, is taken from Townsville 
um, and uh, and it was from the 2019 floods. And um, those houses you can see are all fairly new developments that were were put in place. Um, and unfortunately were built and completed and then they experienced quite a significant rainfall event and um, and the white the white houses uh, the white roofs reflect councils up niches up there to reduce carbon footprint um, but unfortunately um, as you can see the the design of the houses uh, and their flood levels um, probably weren't as resilient as they should have been at a uh, so I mean one of the one of the big things that the, the, the great innovation that the state planning policy has has done and the legislative reforms is usher in a new a new approach um, to planning uh, at a, a, a local level. Previously, we were about managing um, our exposure, um, you know, identifying and communicating where flooding occurs, where coastal hazard is prevalent, where landslide occurs, where bushfire is likely, etc. Um, now we've moved into or transitioned into becoming a more risk based uh, approach and you know we, we look to manage the risks in a holistic way and also support recovery uh, particularly from from those extreme events and um, you know and this is this is really this has really been a challenge um, and a very a very good innovation I, I would say um, as a land use planner of, of some 20 odd years experience now this is this is this is something that I'd, I'd been doing anyway as part of you know, just general practice in, in managing land uses, but um, it's 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 now starting to be it's now starting to to make its way to a wider audience and um, and part of the 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 practice of meeting the state interests is that we now go very very a very a very methodical risk assessment process um, of identifying our our hazard extents. We we determine um, the levels of hazard associated with that. Um, you know, we evaluate um, the consequences to people, or people uh, property, community assets, uh, open space, hard physical, uh, now and into the future. Um, we, assess, we, assess, we assess the risk and then determine whether or not there are mitigations available to us to reduce that level of risk. And then we evaluate those, those mitigations, implement them where they're feasible, monitor uh, monitor them and learn and you know and um and repeat uh, and to improve or or may may not do anything um and uh and i i i'm sorry to i hope this an acronym isn't strange to anybody but the the keep it simple statements um you know just sort of breaks down the policy a, a little bit so you know what the policy state planning policy is doing to local governments um you know is it's about improving our practices and decision making um based on our current state of knowledge to to again um avoid accommodate mitigate defend or abandon um and and recover from natural hazards events so uh, as you can see there there's similar pathways uh, of ad adaptation that that you all had, had illustrated um and this you know and it's and like i said it's a it's it's applying some very sound principles of governance uh, uh to to the land use planning framework but um but one of the failings of our policy framework is is that it doesn't it doesn't really articulate uh uh it, it doesn't really articulate who should be doing what and you know as i said before this this has been a bit uh challenging um for a lot of local governments and planners to understand how we integrate all the different elements of risk management um but i i must say um as i said before the city the city has benefited from some great engineering and great practices uh you know from for many many years and 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 coming on board to to council i was pretty fortunate to to work closely uh with a very very good engineer hamid uh, and um and uh and he he um he was primarily part you know focusing on floods and waterways uh and um and as part of the 2010 um uh, sustainable flood mitigation strategy uh which he wrote and developed uh, in council um he he put together this this wonderful uh conceptual framework to uh to help explain how the different elements of council uh, and, and indeed all stakeholders involved in risk management now uh, need to be need to be um, uh, how they work and interact and, and what their purpose is to do. And so this has been um, 
you know, a, a conceptual relationship. I, I think most most uh, people would have hopefully have seen in, in the literal, lit, literature uh, in terms of best practice, but it's it's Gold Coast is one of the few places where I've seen actually seen it articulated within within a, a council uh, policy document. So. As you can see, you know, as conceptually, um, it also works. While it was developed for flooding, it, it also works for all of the natural hazard areas. And and just to be quickly explain of it, you know, we we the hazard part in itself, um, you know, can be exposure of it can be reduced through through engineering, building dams or seawalls or, or, or geo geotech stabilization. Um, uh, you know, we can we can reduce our exposure through land use planning by not putting people and settlements in areas where uh, where exposure is 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 extreme or high or damaging and we can also look to manage our vulnerability um, uh, through through our emergency management and and also to you know just focusing on those vulnerable sectors of the community and you know we can take all of these activities to reduce to reduce our exposure and our risk uh, our, our elements to to smaller and smaller scales but noting that you know at, at some point um, it's it's a uh, it's there's only so much we can do we are challenged by um, time and space and, and finances and, and no matter what we do um, there'll always be some some level of risk that we we need to li to live with but I mean it's it, but it is a wonderful sort of way to represent that, you know, managing risk is not one person's responsibility or not one group's responsibility. Um, you know, we have a large city assets area that is involved in developing roads, managing drainage, managing uh, storing, uh, uh, flood storage, managing, uh, managing water. Um, we have a fairly, fairly large planning unit and we have a fairly large, um, you know, disaster management facility as well. And, um, but, but you know, it really communicates the idea that everybody needs to be involved, uh, and uh, and our and we really need to be sure ensuring that over time, you know, as as much as we we push these these levels in, um, they don't keep expanding out because of any of the actions in one of these areas. Um, everything needs to be uh, working in a coordinated, integrated way. So. Um, this is something that, you know, again, it's, it's been great to see in our city that, you know, we've, we've been able to conceptualize our working relationships to, to at least uh, make people understand how they work, can work together. Um, so I, I guess the other bit too is it that uh, um, while we've been doing this for a little while, uh, uh, as I was saying before, the state, the state had been going for, I guess, I guess the last since about 2016, 2017, they, they they've restopped the reform process. But for a, for a good five or six years, um, you know, there was there's quite a significant bit of reform across state government uh, as it grappled with a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of different um, competing ideologies. Uh, and um, and while and while the state planning policy was being uh, uh, rolled out by one government department. Um, Another government department, the Department of Environment and Sciences, were rolling out their their program for managing coastal hazards, and uh, and um, not long after the dust settled, um, we were able to they they announced the the Q Coast Twenty One Hundred uh, program, um, which I'm, some of you may not be aware of, but it was it, it is it, it it has been a great government initiative uh, actually. It's been it's been a, a very progressive and um, and forward-thinking bit of policy. Um, my only criticism of it is that it it didn't it didn't coordinate with what the uh, state planning group were were saying. So um, it, it it was a bit difficult being a local government having a planning group say one thing and then uh, another group say same same thing uh, and expecting us to do you know, follow the pathways, but they, they, they would never meet. It was one, it was a, for a while there, um, all that risk management work that we were supposed to do to inform our, um, our planning scheme and our settlement patterns in terms of identifying extent and risks. Um, the framework provided by the state government under the, uh, under the Q Coast uh, didn't link up. And so, it was quite a difficult issue for us at the time to sort of commit to doing a, a coastal hazard adaptation strategy. Um, 
because it, it, it didn't technically meet any, at the time, any of the statutory obligations that the council needed to do. This was, this was all about um, uh, just being forward and proactive in, in planning. But, but eventually the, the streams, the two streams met in the middle um, and we were able to, to, to commit to doing the Q Coast as part of our, our forward planning for, for land uses and development in the city. And, um, um, but unfortunately, the start of it, I had to, had to go out on a, on a fairly big limb here in council and, and convince uh, the elected members and our executive that it, doing a, a CHAS was, a, uh, was, a, was a, a good thing to do. Um, uh, it was only after we started the process that the policy sort of aligned, and and, uh, and so, so at the time, I, I people would ask me, "What's the point of doing a chas?" and and this was my my simple statement that I I said what the benefits sort were, and it, and it was, and it was a uh, even though both both were concerning about risk assessment at a very simple level, the the chas gave us a a very much a, a SWOT analysis of our city's capacity to absorb uh, sea level uh, seawater, gradually, suddenly, periodically, and, and even permanently. And um, and and doing it uh, will guide actions that would either be transformative, depending on what our analysis finds, require augmentation of our business as usual approaches, or or it may may show us that we don't need to do anything. Um, but we won't know any of that until we actually go through and commit to it. So. So council committed to doing its coastal hazard adaptation strategy uh, at the end of 2018. Um, it, it was a it was a steep a steep curve uh, for us to 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 get on board um, because we had to our funding funding was limited for uh, we only had we only had a, a 18 months I think to to complete all eight phases of the project. But um, but thankfully, well, uh, COVID COVID allowed us to to um, ex extend that um, in order to improve our community consultation. So, so yeah, our coastal hazards looked primarily at, at our coastal and tidal waterways. Uh, it looked at erosion, uh, it looked at sea level rise, and it looked at storm surge. Um, and uh, and you know, to, honestly, it's been a great body of work. And earlier this year, um, the Q Coast Board endorsed our, our coastal adaptation plan. And um, again, uh, it's a plan, not a strategy. And, and, and this was part of the, sort of the, the framework that we're operating within council because strategies have a, have a different, different level of status. Um, and to be fair to, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of work in that coastal management efforts over a number of years. Uh, and, um, and, you know, we, we, we weren't too sure what our transformative activity is, but so we labeled it as a, as a plan um, as a means of being able to to you know provide communicate to our community what what the city is doing now uh, and what it will intend to do over the next next ten years um, uh, in terms of of managing coastal impacts. So just some of the detail within that plan, and I apologise for the, um, uh, the the clarity here, but um, I mean the the plan in itself in the short term uh, sets out about fifteen specific actions. Um, that mainly fall within business as usual activities uh, for the city. So, you know, we, we were coming off a pretty solid base when we started uh, doing our, our, our assessment um, and understanding our, our risks. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, having, having looked and evaluated those, you know, there's, there's a number of, of, of key bits of um, activities that, you know, that only need to be sli tweaked slightly to, to sort of to, to, to look at the risks that we face. And, and we, we identified each of the actions, at least in the short term, under our, our response types. So whether, you know, we, we, we promoted eco-based system responses, um, we recognize that, you know, there are hard engineering and, and probably some hybrid solutions that can be progressed. Um, there, not everything is, is about putting stuff into the ground. We do have planning and policy responses. And then of course, there's activities for which our community um, can be involved in as well. And so each of the categories there were sort of activities were identified under which sort of sector that, that they would fall. But the other, the other good thing is, is that we also were able to communicate to our, to our community how, how we might look to manage impacts moving and risks moving forward. And over a particular time frame too. I mean, one of the issues that we often faced was that 2100 um, is, a, is a long, 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 long way away. Um, 
So, you know, our, our corporate strategies and plans and frameworks really last out to 20 years. So, so we kind of had to sort of show that, you know, what we do now is, is moving, is, you know, puts us in a position for future activities. And, and in each of the transformative elements that, you know, we may adopt as a strategy in the future, um, you know, there are different points in which we can evaluate um, what to do and, and where we can. And, and this, this lends itself a lot to, you know, some of the learnings we came out of, out of the, um, the assessment of risk and the extent of hazards. So um, this is only one of, of hundreds of different uh, images that, you know, sort of uh, look at all the different dimensions of risks and, and assets across the city. But uh, what it does show is that, you know, for each of the catchments that we are looking here, each of these segments rec uh, looks at each of the exposure of the different catchments within the city. Um, at different time frames from present day to 2050 to 2070 and in 2100. And, you know, while present day there are risks, there's no doubt about it, we're not living in a bubble. We, we do understand there are a, a lot of risks. What we do know that is that from 2050 onwards, things step up quite quickly. That's assuming that we, we do nothing, you know, or at least achieve 80 centimetres by 20, 2100 under the current mitigation framework. But um, I think we understand now that that's, that will need to be evaluated. So, but the good news is that we didn't have to rush in to do anything. We've got we've got a chance to figure out, um, you know, and work out what we need to do. But we we have to start. We have to start now. We can't. This is not to say that we can delay anything. But you know, we we can. We've got a bit of time to experiment and be innovative and and look at at what are you know uh, the great adoption uh, adaptation things that we could do. And so again, you know, all of this sort of again fits into our our, 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 our corporate framework. Our, our corporate plan recognises that our exposure, uh, we are exposed, uh, and we need to adapt to to changing environment and climate. Um, the coastal hazard strategy feeds in into our city plan, our, our planning scheme, uh, whereas our ocean beaches and natural hazard city also also feed into that, but. Um, they are key signature strategies of, of council and and definitely and and have a and are resourced appropriately for that. So, um, and you know, again, you know, there's there's a there always has been a key body of work that you know we support resilience um, by making strategic land use decisions informed by decisions to support um, systems such as uh, our models, and these models can be developed to to determine both the extent and inform emergency management. So. Um, we, we were coming off a very solid base when looking at climate resilience. Uh, I, I think a lot of what we found, at least in Queensland, it has been very, very solid. And um, I'm like just conscious of time, so I'll, I'll fly through these, these next few slides. Um, so what we're doing now, as I said before, we, we've got a legacy of, of looking at management, uh, engineering outcomes uh, to, to protect the coast, uh, at least from erosion and, and, and some inundation. Um, uh, on the open coast, uh, these, this is just a simple schematic to show um, uh, that, you know, uh, our, our beaches areas here, uh, the, the state identifies a, a, a state erosion prone area with, uh, this can vary from, from 10 metres to, to, to 100 metres depending on the coast. Um, so this is an area in which there needs to be specific controls to deal with development um, where it is already zoned. Uh, it's not it's not easy to back zone property in Queensland. Um, councils are liable for any loss uh, of value uh, an individual may suffer for planning decisions. So, um, so part of the reason why the city's been able to develop is that we've we've you know we've protected the, the development along in these erosion prone areas by requiring people to build a, a seawall uh, of a standard design. We we call it the A line, and um, its alignment stretches all all along the urban area of, of the city or the open coast. Uh, it's a fairly substantial piece of infrastructure. It's about 16 metres wide and can be about four metres, four or five metres high. Uh, but that's, uh, and that's excavated out. It can be in private property. The alignment runs through both public and private property and private property owners are required to build their section of the seawall um, irrespective, uh, along the A-line, irrespective of whether or not it's in um, their property or not. Um, it does cause a few policy issues, but um, it, it, it's getting done. And so we require development be set back for that wall so it can be maintained. And then obviously the development needs to go through some of the, depending on your height of the development, you know, we also 
manage risks a bit more by asking asking people to put in erosion resistant footings as well. At a canal level, um, you know, there's this is again a schematic to look at our waterways, whether they be natural or, or, or artificial with our canals. And again, uh, well, well, at least with canals, they are constructed um, landscapes. So, um, you know, we can determine um, the extent to which the, the, the aquatic and terrestrial environments uh, interact. And so as, the, as, they, as they've been shaped over the years, um, most canal properties have uh, an area that's, that provides for habitable development to occur. Um, this is generally set back from the waterway or from where the constructed revetment wall needs to be. And then the area in here, which is our waterway building setback area, generally needs to be free of, of um, permanent development or development or non-habitable development it, it should promote, if only to ensure that should the seawall, uh, should the revetment wall fail, we're not seeing homes um, falling into the sea uh, or, or into the waterway. And, and it, resilience is, is 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 uh, that that habitable space is usually constructed at a level that corresponds with the flood level. So, um, and the third bit is the artificial sea, uh, artificial reef that we've developed uh, in, in parts of the city. Uh, that was the engineering solutions, one of the nature-based solutions that have been pioneered in the city, and and with great acknowledgement to our catchment management areas. There's about 800 um, meters of of uh, the Coomera River. Uh, sits adjacent to a fairly substantial uh, public park area uh, that is subject to uh, significant erosion and rainfall events. And, and instead of rock revetting it or doing the traditional hard engineering approaches, we were able to, they were able to get some funds to do uh, a nature-based solution of, um, of, uh, uh, of, of looking to minimize the impact of uh, erosive forces um, in there and, and just allow for a bit more recovery. So. This, this project has been, this is called the Damien Leading, Damien Leading Park Bank Stabilization Project. You can look it up. Um, it, it's, we are identifying a few other sites along the stretch of the Cooma River, um, uh, in which to, to, to facilitate more nature-based bank, bank stabilization for eroding environments. And, and again, it, it, it's very simple. Uh, it doesn't look, like much, but you know, there's been a lot of engineering and a lot of analysis that supported the location of, of where we've put the um, uh, the logs, at least how we've stabilised the banks, and then supported the replanting. And um, and after after three years, it's performed really, really well. Um, again, earlier this year, we had significant flooding coming down through here, uh, and the and it withstood uh, it with the, you know the the structures withstood the forces that were coming through and. And since then, um, local habitat values have, have uh, abounded, um, come back. It's a great fishing spot. Um, fit, the locals love it. It's been, it's been a wonderful bit of success. And I, and I believe it's one of the first uh, sort of soft bank rehabilitation trials that, that have been put out um, around the, uh, in, in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and, it's, and it's working very well. And as I said before, we're, we're looking at um, repeating this across a number of different locations um, in the Cooma River catchment, which sits to the north um, and, uh, and, um, and looking at how we might roll it out across the other city's catchments. Just by way of detail, this lake was an artificial, uh, is artificial. It, it was an old extraction pit um, that provided spoil to build a Pacific highway. And, um, and eventually was turned into residential estate and it's come to council as open space. Um, the other things that we have done too um, is look at, at a landscape level. This map here sort of shows the extent of our flooding overlay map in the city plan. Um, so there's quite a bit of, of land, about 20% of our land in the city is flood affected. Um, uh, and with this, in, area here, and as I spoke before, there were the 1800, the Garangumba floodplain uh, is that the largest flood storage um, uh, area, natural uh, urban floodplain in, in, in the country. And, uh, and it, it, it covers across some multiple suburbs and areas. Um, and as you can see, oh, well, sorry, the, the, the detail's not there, but that orange, uh, we've zoned that land limited constraint development. So there is a real, that you can't do, you can't build this urban type of development in through here. It's, it's uh, unfortunately, there was a little bit, I mean, there is some development here. This is the Rabina Town Centre through here. Uh, again, another quite a significant bit of development. Um, 
but um, we we are currently in court. I had to, unfortunately, um, there were some very clever lawyers and developers that saw some holes in our planning scheme and proposed a number of developments in these particular areas in here. And, and in the last couple of years, I've had to quickly write some new temporary legislation while we update our flood code to, to, to at least not well prevent to articulate the type of outcomes that we want to see in that and 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 unfortunately those developments didn't quite fit those so uh, that it's provided a big signal to to stay out of these areas unless unless you're developing in accordance with council's policies uh, another another bit of landscape protection that we're looking at is also to the north the kingamba wetlands and this is part of a partnership project that we're doing with the Department of Environment and Science as well in terms of climate adaptation planning for natural uh, areas. So the Kumambar wetlands is about 460 areas of, of uh, tidal waterways. Uh, it has a creek which sits about 15 kilometres back into some extensively urban areas. Um, and this is all Ramsar listed wetland through here. So there's quite a significant bit of environment. And there's koala population. Um, it's got everything and, and it's surrounded by urban development and, and increasing urban development. So we've been undertaking some very basic scientific studies to look at sedimentation rates and bathymetry in the area, uh, identifying how mangroves are expanding and then looking at how uh, the hydraulic inputs into this. And, um, and we hope to come up with, uh, uh, once we've got our baseline, then we can look at all the activities that we are moving, um, that we can use to, to, to fit within our adaptation strategies. Um, at a policy and planning level, we have some very clear requirements for land development. So if you are a, literally a land developer, um, you have to you have to make sure that risks, and particularly in the flood affected area are managed. We have a, we have a fairly straightforward um, uh, requirement for any development in the flood affected, flood affected areas maintains its flood storage balance. So there has to be um, a balance cut and fill on your site. You can't just import fill into the site. You have to source it from within. Uh, and then you need to be able to do it at such a level where any, if level, there is some level of exposure that is accepted and that's no more than, than 0.6 of development. Uh, and we try to make that areas exposed to be um, non-habitable. Um, also to one of the other things that we've been pushing to is that where, where people, you know, where they can, uh, we, we call it minimum flood free land. So where land is being subdivided, um, we, we, we encourage people or we require the developers to ensure that wherever they're putting their building platform, that's, that's provided at a level that meets the designated flood level. So any ha homes or habitable areas that go on top of that um, uh, have further level of resilience. And that's been a longstanding policy too uh, of our city. And um, yeah, sorry. And yeah, and again, this is all, thank you for, for the opportunity to talk and present to you. I, I'm sorry I had to rush it, but there's, I could have talked for another couple of hours uh, on everything that's going on in the city, but um, we'll leave it at that and um, leave it for questions. Thank you, um, Pradesh. Um, we do have a few questions in there. And um, if we could also have your put on his video as well. Um, so there's a question um, on really the regulatory environment you, you mentioned, and I saw that map um, having been chair of Brisbane Water and then moved to the SCQ Water board, I can see the different lens. So um, there's a question, um, how do we um, have fully integrated urban planning across multiple um, parts of government? And is there anything that is happening in that way? Just a quick response. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we're always encouraged to integrate, but yeah, at, at the moment, you know, um, <clears throat> In the middle, I guess, yeah, the state will do what the state wants. And, um, and you know, and unfortunately, uh, you know, they've got authority and, and lack of, a, 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 they've got high public, uh, they've got limited liability for their decisions as well. So um, councils can do a lot of things, but, you know, we've just got an issue of where in the middle of our, our flood planning and flood modelling, the state announced a new um, 45 kilometre bit of highway duplication called the Coomera Connector, which is in the middle of the middle of, uh, or sits right in the middle of our, uh, of, of the lower catchment. And, you know, that 
you know, that caused us to go back and, and look at what those hydraulic impacts would be. So that was a that was a challenge challenge for us uh, at the time. Um, but unfortunately, it's it's going ahead, um, and um, it's what we need to do. So I just think that um, uh, I just think I um yeah I, I just think that yeah we pr perhaps there needs to be more integration at, at a regional level. State governments just can't make policy at at, at state level. They need to sort of to articulate things at a at a at a regional level and and conduct simply. I think to enhance integration. Okay, so Jörg, um, there's a question here for you um, about floating housing structures. So again, very interesting. I had no idea of the difference that four different scenarios would be for one piece of um, real estate. Um, so there's a question here from a waste and wastewater engineer. Um, how would you connect to water, sewage, power, etc., given that this we sometimes struggle to get really tight connections in firm ground. How would you see these flexible connections working? So a technical sort of question. Technical, but very nice question. So there are examples um, where they are just connecting. They are floating houses. They are connecting them to the to the land-based in infrastructure. Yeah? You can either pump it up or what, however you get it in the, in, the, in the existing infrastructure. So I know it from Dubai, for example, but also from uh, their, their larger floating developments in, in Netherlands. That's also, that's the one possibility. Um, in the end, um, what we are trying to achieve is and that's, that's something which is connected to the, the COASIS project in the end, is that um, just pumping a wastewater rate doesn't make sense in terms of circular thinking. And so, uh, of course, the ideal would be not to pump things away, but to keep them in the system and to provide also for the rest, um, rest of the infrastructure also some, some elements um, which can deal with wastewater. Yeah? So wastewater is, is, a, is a resource. Yeah? So if you, if you can reuse that and if you can, if you can turn that, and that's, that's, that's um, really not rocket science, it's, it's, it's possible. If you can, if you can turn the, um, the wastewater into fertilizer and then to use that for, 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 for aquaculture, to start with, with uh, microalgae production, to produce then food and also energy out of that and so on. And and this to, to, to keep that in a floating area or, or floating floating structure that makes much more sense. So both possibilities are possible. Okay. Um, there's another question for either of you um, about the increasing amount of urban waterways in the Gold Coast. Does this help or hinder our resilience? And what are the main barriers to implementing further? adaptation in the city? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, um, I, the, I think it's the more the point, it's the way the urban waterways have been constructed, at least the canals and, uh, and the artificial water, waterways. So, so they've, they've provided a significant level of resilience to, to the city, particularly in the lower part, because um, they, you know, they, they maintain the flood storage of, of you know, volume that, that's there. So, it's um you know it, it is a lot of water that we need it's a lot of bank now that we have to manage and 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 our landowners have to do it so uh, i don't think i think the only issue we have is about you know this this combination of how we transform our banks um particularly around in the canal estates which people pride on having clean concrete and green sort of aesthetic associated with their with their backyards or, or, or their views. So, I mean, we kind of need to look at how we might transform some of that to, to cause that land's not going anywhere. It's gonna erode. It's gonna be subject to a greater tidal prism. So there will be a lot more inundation and tidal water moving through there in the future. So, um, uh, so I, yeah, I, I think they, they've been very helpful to sort of looking at all the different types of uh, adaptation options that, that we need to, to look at. So, um, and as, yeah, sorry. York, do you have a comment? We'll have to wrap up now at six o'clock, but uh, any comment on the city and what you see? Um, yes, of, yeah, I could I could speak for for I don't know how long about the the waterways, the broad water, all the challenges, all the things. Um, I'm happy to be sometimes part of this uh, discussions on different panels. Um, I'm wondering, uh, and that's perhaps a question for 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 Pradesh. 
Um, when, is the, when is the first proposal coming to build just a, a, a dike um, along the whole coastline and then just <laughs> uh, to the waterway and so on, you know, you know to, to, to solve it or try to solve it in a, in a nice engineering way, which would create lots of challenges. Yeah, I, I would never support that, but I'm wondering um, when will that come up? Well, as soon as, a big, as soon as the cost benefit shows that it's worthwhile, I, I would imagine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's, I think at the moment um, we we did we did we have done some preliminary cost benefit of uh, you know of tidal gates across the seaway, um, uh, and but you know the, as as Hamid always says, you know the city Swiss cheese. You know so many holes in our landscape for water to flow in and out. You just can't yeah. build one. Um, so so you know the the nature based solutions are. are from an economic point of view as standing up, they're showing a great bit of return. And um, there's a lot of sediment and sand that moves along. You know, we invest 20 millions of dollars a year just pushing sand around uh, the coast. So um, and it's not going anywhere. So, you know, we, we need to perhaps look at how we might um, utilize that as a source uh, moving forward. And um, yeah, just quickly, thanks Emily for your, for your questions. I, I know you're home with COVID. Thanks for tuning in. Um, uh, the main barrier is further adaptation measures in the city. Honestly, money. Money is the key. Um, you know, it's it, it's hard for us to, to look at cost benefit of adaptation given that mitigation. We're, we're still emissions are still growing. So you know, once once we can get a, a stable look at what um, you know our mitigations are, then we can we can effectively look at adaptation um, and how and how what measures and pathways are, are the most cost effective and. You know, obviously, we're not like other parts of Queensland where, you know, we have to give up land and, and move people out. Uh, we, we haven't reached that stage yet. I, I don't think we will. Um, never say never. But, um, yeah, I think money is the key. I might um, take that as the final comment and um, draw this to a close because we have reached six o'clock. Um, I'd just really like to thank both of you for extremely interesting um, presentations. I've got, you know, some interesting pictures and some buzzwords and, and frameworks which I didn't know existed. So um, I spent a lot of my time in, in the energy transition and this is the other side of the um, adaptation and, and um, thank you and thank you to CM for putting this webinar together and to APSI to hosting it and, and it will be put on the YouTube channel. Um, so thank you to you both. Thank you and um, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.